Good morning and welcome to the Sports Card here on ESPN2. I'm your host, Tag Kozineski. This week for boxing fans, a big guest, the punching postman, Tony Thornton joins us here. Tony, thanks for joining us today. Pleasure. First of all, tell us about your background growing up as a youngster. I didn't have a background in boxing growing up. Uh, you know, friends messing around in the backyard, you know, uh, without gloves, you know. And we used to do what we call banging to the body, you know, just punching one another as hard as we could oh in the body until one or another would give, you know. So that that's basically the background. Uh, I had a cousin we called the Flash because his hands were so fast. <clears throat> excuse me, and he was uh, <clears throat> very instrumental and started at an early age. Uh, he was three, well still is, three years older than I. And uh, he used to slap us around quite often and uh, that was like my uh, rude awakening to boxing. So you said this is fun, I'd kind of like to get involved based off of that? Or uh, when did it, you finally decide, hey, this is something I'd like to try? Well, not at that time. Uh, my parents bought me uh, gloves for Christmas. I used to beat on my brother and my friends. Uh, but I was more interested in, in playing football on a higher level than, than fighting. I mean, I had no interest in boxing whatsoever other than uh, being macho out in the street with your mm -hmm. friends, you know. But I was interested in playing basketball in the street, uh, playing football, running track uh, in high school. I was track of the, uh, I mean, captain of the track team okay. and uh, captain of the football team. So these were things that I was more interested in than boxing. You live in Glassboro now. Are you a, were you in South Jersey all your life? Yes, uh, I was. You know, I was born in Lady Lords Hospital in Camden, okay. Glassboro. You know, from an infant, and uh, I still reside in Glassboro. I built a house there four years ago, and uh, I guess I'll be staying there for quite some time. So, ha when age did you actually start boxing? I was 19 years old. Well, just prior to my 19th birthday, uh, I started. I was playing football at Westchester State now University, and uh, there, there didn't seem to be a future for me playing football at 5'8", 155 pounds. So uh, we had an intramural boxing program up there and I decided to try it and uh, I did. And I became the intramural champion by winning three consecutive fights, three knockouts. And uh, Westchester had a very good squad at that time. So a traveling squad which went around and fought Temple, Penn State, Air Force wow. Academy, Naval Academy, uh, Lehigh, Villanova. We fought all these guys. It was just like a varsity basketball team. So uh, I got a spot as a junior middleweight on the team, the varsity team, and uh, I won a national championship freshman year. So uh, the nationals were held at Westchester that year. Okay. Uh, HBO televised it, and uh, I became national champ, junior middleweight. Now, with the intramural program, the boxing program, is there one coach? Do you have a couple other people who help you learn the game mentally as well as physically? Yes, there was one, what you would call head coach. Uh, he was. We call him, a, in the pros, we call him a trainer. Okay. But uh, he was the coach in college, and uh, we had a couple associates, and we also had some associate boxing coaches, you know, which uh, these guys had been on the team for years. Uh, some had graduated, some were still students, and they were teaching the younger guys, like myself. Now, what are some of your training routines? We'll say, first of all, as you start in college, uh, what do you have to do to get yourself ready for a fight? Well, in the, in the amateurs, which is college, it's, it's a little different than the pros. We had three two-minute rounds where you had to really exert yourself in a short period of time, you know, and impress the judges or get a knockout or, you know, to, to win the fight. Uh, and the pros is totally different. We did the same basic workouts. I didn't run nearly as far, and I didn't work uh, nearly as hard, you know, in the amateurs as I, as I did as a pro. Who taught you about working and again did that all come from your coach or the, the manager at that point told you this is how you get into shape? Well the, the coaches taught us uh, some of the you know f fighters who had, had preceded us were able to teach us and uh, I had I had one guy who was very instrumental in teaching me something and that was Jimmy Clark he was on the the USA the national team you know who he fought internationally against Poland and, you know, uh, the Germans and wh whoever, you know, the uh, U.S. squad was fighting against. And uh, he was the guy who missed the plane when they were on their way to Warsaw, Poland. And uh, the plane went down and killed the whole U.S. team. He was late every day picking me up to train with him. Mm -hmm. And he was late and he missed his flight that day. Wow. And that saved his life. He was the only guy to survive because he didn't catch the plane. That is amazing. You, uh, you had talked about a few minutes ago about judges. 
Uh, I wouldn't consider myself the most knowledgeable person in the world of boxing, but just a casual fan and enjoys the sport. What are your thoughts on the way that boxing is scored? Because, again, as a fan, I felt like I've watched some fights and I said, boy, this guy's winning, he's winning, winning, and all of a sudden the other guy wins in the decision. What are your thoughts on, especially in the professional level? Well, you said you're not the most knowledgeable fan, you know, in boxing, and it's quite evident some of the judges aren't the most knowledgeable, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? <laughs> That's you what know, I was leaning towards. Viewers, you know. Uh, we, we, have, we have judges, I don't, I don't know what kind of schooling they have, if any, uh, that would, you know, give them the right to call themselves judges, uh, because I, I look at, I, judge and I wonder what fight he's watching, what he's scoring, mm -hmm. and uh, his criteria for scoring. Uh, I, you can't, we have, we pick fighters, all right, if you're watching a fight, you're going to pick someone before the fight even begins. You like this guy, mm -hmm. and so you're going to lean towards him, you know? So I think some judges do the same thing. Uh, you can't watch one fighter or another. You have to watch the action between the two. If I focus on you, I don't see what the other guy's doing. All right. So you just focus on the action between and you can see what both are doing. Has it ever been explained to you what the judges are actually looking for? Like I've heard a 10 point system and it's 10 to 9 or 10 to 8. Could you explain that a little bit for us? Well, the winner of the round should get 10 points. Okay. The winner getting 9 or less. Uh, judges look for good clean shots who's landing the harder shots, who's got a good defense, uh, who's more, should be more aggressive. Uh, there's a number of different things, uh, you know, but then again, to like you and, mm -hmm. and not be scoring in your favor and, you, and you're doing everything correct. I mean, I've been associated with this in fights of my own, you know, and I was wondering, you know, why the judge scored the way they did. I mean, one judge would give me the fight by four rounds, another judge would have me losing by two or three rounds. I mean, they're watching two totally different fights. Do you see anywhere down the line there change any of this? Like if you watch, for example, maybe a figure skating, they throw 10 judges out there. As you mentioned, the difference in the score, the highest one goes, the lowest one goes, they work with the eight in between. It, or are we going to be set with the three judges that we have now and the referee or what have you? We well, you have international judges, you know, in the international competition, like in the Olympics where they have five judges. Okay. And uh, look, look what happened to Roy Jones in the Olympics and they had five judges. Mm -hmm. He clearly won and, and still come, came up losing. So, I mean, I don't, I don't think there's um, any clear-cut answer. How, how tough is it to, for you to treat yourself in the ring? Like you want to give a good appearance for yourself. If you, okay, I just beat this guy, I won. And then all of a sudden the camera's on you and the other guy gets the decision. How tough is that to compose yourself and not want to go nuts on everybody? Well, it's, it's very disheartening, but uh, we, we should consider ourselves uh, good sportsmen, mm -hmm. uh, role models for, you know, for the younger viewers. And, uh, you know, you try to maintain your composure and, uh, you know, you, you, you're going to fight through adversity at one time or another and uh, you just have to maintain. We're going to take a quick break here on the Sports Card. We're here with the Punching Postman, Tony Thornton. We'll be back with more in a moment. Kazaneski, this week's guest, the punching postman, Tony Thornton, a record of 37-7-1, and 26 knockouts, and at one point you held the USBA super middleweight title? Yes, and the USBA middleweight title. How many titles are there? That, that seems to be a little confusing for fans. Well, there's, there are too many. It's saturated. It's watered down to the point that you don't know who the actual world champions are, and uh, it, it's, it's kind of sickening, you know. But uh, the people pay the money to see these people fight. I mean, so they come up, they come up with these alphabet soup titles, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, they're just not, I mean, they shouldn't be sanctioned as world titles. I don't care what they call themselves, you know. But uh, there, there are three legitimate titles, which is the WBA, WBC, which are the two oldest, and the IBF, which I guess came about in about 80, in the early 80s. Okay. Well, Larry Holmes, I think, was the first IBF champion, you know, and uh, the rest, the rest, you can you can toss them out. So you could have three so-called champions World in each champion. weight class. World, World champions. champions in each weight yes. class. Now you also have the sister nations, which I won two titles, which are legitimate. Okay. United States Boxing Association and the North American Boxing Association, which is the NABF and the USBA. <coughs> Excuse me. These have these have always been. Uh, assist organizations to the major world titles and uh, they're, they're almost like 
it's almost like a prerequisite to, to getting a world title. If you win the USBA title, you move into the one, two, or three spot, you know, to fight for the international title. And if you win, you know, the NABF, you move into the same thing for like the WBA or WBC. Now, how are the rankings determined? Does this go back to subjectiveness again? Well, you have you have rating committees okay. who rate a fighter based on his fighters that he's fought in the past, uh, his performance in the, in the present, uh, the fighters that he's fought to get to this point, you know. So that's, you know. Are they pretty much true to form, you think, as you looked at it, we prime your career there? No, they, because you wonder how uh, one guy could be uh, rated in the top ten, uh, as low as two or three, and he, he's fought no one. You know, you wonder if, well, was the uh, organization paid something? Yeah. You know? mm -hmm. I mean, you wonder. And, and quite naturally, like you had uh, Jose Suleiman, the president of the uh, WBC, I mean, he had a direct connection with Don King. So <laughs> all of Don King's fighters would be in the top ten in the WBC. Well, you brought up his name, so I don't have to bring it up. Don King, good, bad for boxing, no comment? Good, good bad, or indifferent, huh? Okay. Uh, you, can, you can say what you want about Don, whether you like or dislike him, uh, his approach to boxing, you know, his, his function in boxing. But King seems to sign the champions. He seems to pay some of them sometimes, some of the money he owes them. And uh, they just, I mean, if fighter would rather make a little of something as opposed to all of nothing, you mm -hmm. know? So either you sign with these guys and fight for whatever you can get, or you refuse to fight for them and be black, you know, on the blacklist, you know, mm -hmm. and, and fight for nothing, you know? So if you're not, if you're not in with a certain promoter who's in that clique, all right, you'll never get a shot. You know, no matter how good you are, you'll never get the exposure, no one will see you. And if the people don't see you, the people don't recognize you, mm -hmm. uh, the TV doesn't want you because you won't get any ratings, and you're, you're just nothing. Did it ever come down to you having any involvement with him or any association near him or seeing him, what have you? Well, as a matter of fact, uh, we were going to fight for Don a couple times in the past. Uh, I met with uh, one of his uh, agents, and uh, Russell, my promoter, is now, you know, working on on getting me a fight with one of his champions, if it will. So, uh, have I had any direct dealings with him? No, that's what I pay my promoter for. Right now, you're on retired status, I guess you could say. Now, you'd mentioned you Until have somebody. Until further notice. Now, what what's involved with that? What's further notice? Until further notice means. The right amount of money, the right situation, I can possibly motivate myself and get myself in shape to uh, take that challenge one more time. Now, do you have a fighter in mind, or are you not able to say that at this point, or do you have a couple fighters in mind that maybe, you know, I might come out and take this well, guy I, on? I can, I manage myself, so I can say whatever to whoever, whenever, okay. you know. Uh, I'm not under contract with anyone. Uh, I wanted to fight Vinny Pazienza, but he turned me down a couple of times. Uh, I would like to fight Nigel Benn, go to England and fight Nigel Benn, if Don King finds it in his heart and his schedule to allow Ben to fight me. So Don King does have a little, like you're saying, he, it can be good, he signs all the good guys, but if you want to come on and fight one of his guys, is it more or less you're, you're going to have to sit down and work at his terms or come to the happy medium if you're fighting one of his guys? Well, you, you kind of you come to a happy medium, but the happy medium seems to lean more towards his terms. Uh, as a matter of fact, I was going to go to England and fight Nigel Ben last year, uh, but the money wasn't right. You know, they offered me seventy-five thousand. I said one hundred and fifty thousand, so they balked at it. So that there was no fight. I mean, it was it would be crazy for me to go to England and fight Nigel Ben when I was going to make two hundred fifty thousand to fight Roy Jones here in the United States. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, it, it didn't make sense at all. So I turned that down. So maybe they'll hold me to that. We'll get to Roy Jones in a second, uh, your last fight on national TV. Uh, what kind of mental preparation do you go to? We talked a little about the physical, mentally before you hit the ring and then mentally when you're in the ring actually fighting. The toughest and hard mentally would be the minutes, you know, preceding the fight. Uh, right, right before the fight, you're in your dressing room, you know, and everything in the world is going through your mind and you're trying to get yourself focused you know you don't need 10 15 people in your dressing room 
hollering, chanting, whatever, you know, trying to psych you up because they're just, it, it annoys you, you mm -hmm. know, you, you're trying to get yourself focused and prepared to fight, you know. I don't want to hear all that garbage, you know. I don't need loud, blaring music like you, some fighters have a bunch of rap music in their dressing room mm -hmm. or, and you know. Man and you man, yeah. everybody's talking to you. Don't want to hear that. Mm -hmm. I'm the one going to be taking the punches, you know. I'm the one who needs to get myself both mentally and physically prepared for what I have to do, and I just don't want to hear it. Now, once you're into the ring, does anything change? What are you focusing on as you are fighting in the ring? I focus on trying to rip his head off. Mm -hmm. and disable my opponent as quickly, as efficiently, as effectively as possible because I'm going to get paid the same amount of money if I go two minutes or ten rounds or twelve rounds. So why put myself at, at risk? So it sounds to me like are you going for the knockout more or less the first you know you're out there here we go you're going for a knockout or do you have kind of a method to what's going on well you, you, you try to be methodical but uh, it doesn't always work so you just go out and do what you have to do you know some fighters you just can't manipulate into a certain situation so you just do what you have to do to win the fight apparently he was, has done it very well we'll take a short break here on the sports card we'll be back with more at the punching postman tony thornton right after this Welcome back to the Sports Card here on ESPN2. I'm Tad Kozineski. This week's guest, the punching Tony Thornton. And Tony, I think this is a topic that needs to be brought up, and unfortunately it's been brought up by it in the national media right now. Tommy Morrison has contracted HIV. I uh, got it through. It, it was discovered out in Las, Las Vegas before a fight. They canceled the fight, and instantly he's become a media figure. When you boxed, was that ever on your mind when you boxed against an opponent, that whole HIV and AIDS? Sure, sure it was. You know, you fighters, fighters get cut, blood flies. Uh, but let's, let's take it a little further. You know, the horse is already out the barn, and now you're going to close the door, mm -hmm. you know? It's, uh, I mean, it's, it's too little, too late, you know? Uh, how many fighters are walking around right now that, that could be infected? Uh, what about someone fixing your food in a restaurant? You don't mm -hmm. know. The people you come in contact with on a daily basis, mm -hmm. uh, shaking hands, hugging people, you just don't know. They, mm -hmm. I mean, there's, there's so very little that's good about, you know, the, the AIDS virus, uh, transmission and so forth. Uh, how, do we, how do we protect the fighters? Mm -hmm. uh, now you're going to start testing fighters prior to them fighting. What about their training camps? When they're training in preparation for a fight, you got two or three sparring partners. Are you going to have these guys tested in the gym? Uh, what about the amateurs coming up? I mean, are Good we going to close our eyes, put blinders on, and say that young guys 14 and 15 aren't are out, uh, you know, fornication? They're, they're yeah. not having sex? I mean, you're going to mm -hmm. test the amateurs. The amateurs are fighting internationally, uh, guys from other countries and so forth. I mean, there has to be some testing done. And what happens when Tommy Morrison tested positive? Mm -hmm. He doesn't believe it. He has a second opinion. He gets a second test. The second test comes up positive. So now he believes this. All right, so you test fighters prior to a fight. If the test comes up negative, all right, are you going to test him again to make sure he's negative? <laughs> if he point. comes up positive, are you going to test him again to make sure he's positive? About us being told the virus can go undetected up yeah, to several months. years. Yeah, several yeah, years, years okay. all right? So a fighter tests negative, and he, but he is positive, you know? So, I mean, who's, who's really being protected here? And, and are we really being protected? If you're the head of boxing in the United States, how would you go about this? Uh, are you going to make everybody test in every state? Uh, to what level do you take this? Well, just like I just said, I mean, what about what about the guys in the gym prior to fights? Mm -hmm. You know, what about the negative and positive testing and and having retest done? I think the states now are implementing mandatory testing only to relieve themselves mm -hmm. of total liability. All right, mm -hmm. we tested him; he came up negative. We have no liability whatsoever. Okay. You know, he came up positive; we have no liability. But do you do a second testing? I mean, who's who's gonna, you know, who's gonna step forward and say, I want to be tested again. I came up negative. I want to be tested again to make sure. You know, mm -hmm. people aren't gonna do that. You know, I don't see one set of rules that might take care of the all problem. Of boxing. Now. No, I mean there are too many there are too many unanswered questions. You know, uh, do you do you put fighters? All right, what if you have two fighters? They both test positive. All right, now they're both positive. Do you allow these guys to fight because they're positive? There can be no harm done. Yeah, you're right. right. So, I mean, wh what are you going to do? 
you put you put gloves on the cornermen, you put gloves on the cut men, the doctors wearing gloves, the fighters are in the ring spewing blood all over mm -hmm. one another. There's blood and sweat flying all out into the audience. You know, the judges are at ringside, you know, and uh, the commission at ringside. How do you how do you stop? Do you garnish everyone with protective gear? Do, I mean, even the crowd? I mean, what do you do? It, it is interesting. It's raised a lot of interesting questions. Magic Johnson. I mean, would would you guard would you guard Magic? You definitely I mean, have to think of it. Yeah. Would you swipe at him? Oh well, the chances are are one in a million. You know, would but you, you want to be that chance. one? Would you want to yeah. be that one to hit the lot? I mean, that type mm -hmm. of lottery. You know, uh, you go to block a shot, you scratch him with your fingernail. I mean, who wants to be the one? The, the next question is kind of a personal question. Uh, Myself, if I found out another boxer had it, you, of course you want to be as kind as you can. I personally would not want to go into a ring if I knew that. But say there was a situation in another country, they allowed if one was and was, one wasn't. For yourself, is that something that you would stay away from if you knew your opponent was already, they said to you, Tony, yes, he oh, doesn't sure, I'd stay away from it. Sure, I'd stay away. I was, I was tested, you know, prior to the fight. And uh, if I came up negative, they told me I'd be, I mean, positive, I'd be sent mm -hmm. home. You know what I mean? So I think everyone should be. Sure. Uh, hopefully things will move along. We have about a minute here before we go. You fought Roy Jones. That was your last fight national TV in his hometown. It must have been a real interesting experience for you. It was. Very interesting experience. Uh, you know, I had a slight injury prior to the fight, but nobody listens. Nobody cares. Uh, nobody wants to hear excuses. Mm -hmm. A man's got to do in a certain situation. And if they called me tomorrow to fight Roy Jones again, I'd be there without a doubt. You know, you drop a hat, I'd be there. I enjoyed watching. Hopefully we can see you in the ring again. If not, best of luck in the rest of your life here, Tony. Thank you. It was Thanks for taking here. the time. Again, Tony Thornton, the punching postman. Next week here, we'll talk to Danny Barbary. He's a replacement baseball player that played with the Phillies. That'll be next here on the Sports Card.